Hello and welcome to the first of a three-part video series here taking a look at tropical cyclone intensity change. We've kind of already talked about this at the end of our previous video series about tropical cyclone formation where we started to take a look at the energetics behind tropical cyclone intensification. We build on that here in this video looking at this concept of a maximum potential intensity. So let's dig in. So as we recall from our previous video series, we can conceptualize the tropical cyclone as a heat engine or a Carnot cycle from thermodynamics uh, concepts. We have a heat reservoir given by the underlying ocean here from which the tropical cyclone gains heat energy along that inflow leg from A to B as air spirals in from large distances away to the center to the center itself. So it's gaining heat energy in the form of enthalpy, or we could view this as entropy or moist static energy equivalent potential temperature, gaining heat in the form of temperature and moisture from the underlying ocean. So keep that in mind as we go forward. We're gaining energy primarily from the underlying ocean in the form of enthalpy or any of those other thermodynamic quantities that we have talked about. The tropical cyclone, however, is not perfectly efficient at converting that heat, where we view it in the form of enthalpy, but nearly equivalently, we could do this in the form of entropy, equivalent potential temperature, and moist static energy. They're all roughly related to moisture and temperature with some pressure dependence in the form of sensible and latent heat into kinetic energy. So all that we gain from the underlying ocean doesn't go straight into fueling the winds of the storm. There's some amount of that that is ultimately lost. This allows us to define this concept of efficiency. How efficient is it at converting the heat input into kinetic energy? And as you might expect, it can be expressed as this ratio of how much energy that has gone in to con create kinetic energy to the actual energy input itself from the underlying ocean. Mathematically, this takes the form of that work done divided by that energy input, which we'll refer to here as G. And on our next slide, we'll show how this simplifies to the surface minus the outflow temperature. So the difference in temperature over the depth of the troposphere from the underlying ocean, which is controlled primarily by the gain of heat energy from the underlying ocean, to the outflow level, roughly 100, 150 hectopascals, divided by the surface temperature. So we're not saying by this that work is just the difference of these two temperatures and that the energy input is just the surface temperature, just that the mathematical expression for this simplifies down to this ratio here. Typically this has values on the order of 0.25 to 0.4. In general, if you have a higher tropopause and thus a colder outflow temperature, you'll get a greater numerator, which leads to a greater uh, efficiency. If you have a greater surface temperature, Though you, all, though you increase the numerator, you also increase the denominator. The ratio favors increasing the numerator, however. So increasing the surface temperature and or decreasing the outflow temperature lead to a greater efficiency. And that's part of why uh, the sea surface temperature has such a strong control on the intensity of a cyclone, and especially as we'll show the potential intensity. It leads to a higher surface temperature here that leads to a more efficient cyclone in terms of utilizing the energy that it gains from the underlying surface, and it also leads to more energy that is able to be gained from the underlying surface. So we can come back to this work diagram that we very briefly introduced in our last video series here. On the y-axis, we have temperature, and on the x-axis, we have entropy, where entropy is also a function of temperature, moisture, and pressure, just like enthalpy. So we could qualitatively or crudely think of this as entropy as well. And we have our four legs, A, which is our inflow leg, isothermal as it is, so the surface temperature is constant along that inflow leg, but we go from an ambient value of entropy, S sub A, to a moist value of entropy, S sub E, as we gain energy from the underlying surface. Temperature stays the same, but the entropy and the enthalpy, theta E, moist static energy, all increase as air flows inward. Then we have our moist adiabatic ascent, our leg B here, along with our outflow. So temperature decreases from the surface temperature to the outflow temperature as you go along that moist adiabatic ascent. However, moist entropy, equivalent potential temperature, moist static energy, enthalpy are all conserved along that ascending branch here. <laughs> 
as we go to our first isothermal descent leg, C at large radii, we lose entropy or enthalpy, more static energy equivalent potential temperature, but we maintain our temperature at that outflow temperature here. And then along leg D, which continues our descent from the upper troposphere back toward the surface at large distances from the center, we cool from our outflow temperature to the surface temperature, doing so moist adiabatically, as warming due to adiabatic compression is offset partially by cooling due to radiation that leads to us maintaining an approximately moist adiabatic profile and thus maintaining a value of entropy roughly that is equal to its ambient or environmental value. So this square is nice because that's actually a measure of how much work is done to fuel the tropical cyclone's winds. You have an energy input along leg A and an energy output along leg C, and the area of this square given by A, B, C, D gives you the amount of work that is done. So all we have to do is multiply the length of one of the sides, which is just the surface minus the outflow temperature, by the length of the other side, which is the moist entropy minus the ambient entropy. And that's what we have here with our equation. In terms of the energy gained from the underlying ocean, this is going to be related to that difference in moist and ambient entropy here at that surface temperature at which that energy is gained. So one way that we could write this is the surface temperature times that difference, that uh, leg length here A from the moist to the ambient entropy. And so we simply take the ratio. This first bullet describes W, the second bullet describes G, and putting that all together, we get the ratio of the surface minus the outflow temperature to the surface temperature here. Those differences in entropy end up ultimately canceling out. So we get this version of efficiency that we see here. Now, if you look in the scientific literature related to tropical cyclones and this concept of efficiency, you'll sometimes see efficiency written like this with the surface temperature in the denominator, and other times you'll see it written slightly differently with the outflow temperature in the denominator. The difference between these two comes from other heat sources that we are not including within our discussion. In particular, along leg A, not only is it typically isothermal, but there is also typically extra heat gained through the dissipation of turbulent energy along that inflowing leg. This gain of energy leads to a larger energy input, and if you work the math through, it leads to an efficiency with the outflow temperature in the denominator. So because the outflow temperature is lower than the surface temperature, that leads to an efficiency that is higher than that which would be inferred from the surface temperature here in the denominator, but still on the order of typically about 0.3 to 0.5 rather than 0.25 to 0.4. So we can utilize this idea of energy inputs and define an available potential energy. So not necessarily specifically that surface temperature minus that entropy difference, but something very closely related to that here, where instead of an entropy difference, we have an enthalpy difference here. The saturation enthalpy of the ocean governed by the sea surface temperature and the saturation specific humidity at that sea surface temperature and pressure, as well as the enthalpy of the air governed by the air temperature and the specific humidity, not the saturation specific humidity, but just the specific humidity of the air at that temperature and at that pressure. And like our sensible and latent heat fluxes that we introduced in our previous video series, we also have our wind speed here given by the magnitude of the 10 meter wind, we have density, and then we have an exchange coefficient that governs how readily able we are to exchange heat between the ocean and the atmosphere that lies above. We also throw in our efficiency epsilon here uh, to be able to show that we're not just looking at the maximum amount of energy that we're able to gain from the underlying surface, but our ability to actually convert that over to work to fuel the tropical cyclone itself. So we're looking at the available potential energy that actually goes into fueling the tropical cyclone's winds, which is crucially dependent upon that enthalpy difference. At 
higher sea surface temperature, you have a higher sea surface temperature, of course, as well as a higher specific saturation, uh, saturation specific humidity. At lower pressure, this is also higher for that same sea surface temperature. So this is that air-sea disequilibrium that we talked about in the concept or context of temperature and specific humidity before, now just encapsulating the two of them into a single formulation. So in the absence of dissipation, which we can think of in terms of friction, a cyclone could theoretically gain energy from the underlying ocean surface forever due to that pressure dependence on the saturation specific humidity here. So you could always have this difference here be a positive value because as you get a stronger and stronger cyclone, air comes from higher pressure to much, much, much lower pressure as it spirals inward, you could in theory create what is known as a hypercane a system with a sea level pressure of 700, 600, 500 millibars. Obviously, we don't see those because we can't neglect friction within the actual atmosphere. So we have to balance this available potential energy with this concept of dissipation. So we can create a chart. We'll have energy here on the y-axis and the 10 meter wind speed here on the x-axis. We've shown that for any given enthalpy difference, our available potential energy scales with the 10 meter wind speed. And it scales linearly because it's a straight multiplicative factor. But there's also frictional dissipation that also scales with that 10 meter wind speed. And it actually scales with the cubic value of that 10 meter wind speed. So we can write that as capital D here. We have an exchange coefficient here known as drag, the ability to exchange momentum between the underlying surface and the atmosphere that lies above. For a very rough surface like an urban area, this might be very large. For a smoother surface like ocean, this might be relatively small. We have our density and then we have our 10 meter wind speed cubed here. So if we create plots of what these two look like, our input related to that available potential energy is given by this red line here that is roughly linear for a constant value of enthalpy difference. And our dissipation takes more of this cubic structure here. At lower wind speeds for a given amount of energy availability, input exceeds the ability to dissipate that energy. And so the cyclone can continue to intensify because of the input energy exceeding that which is lost to dissipation. However, once you get to a specific value of wind speed where these two lines cross over, you are no longer able to use that energy coming in from the underlying ocean to fuel the storm. Dissipation exceeds that. So you're going to actually lose energy until you reach back to this point where the lines cross over once again. We define that point where the lines cross over, given by the star coming down here to the x-axis, as our maximum potential intensity, or sometimes referred to just as the potential intensity. For the given enthalpy difference that we have, so given the sea surface temperature that we see as relative to the atmospheric conditions in which the storm is embedded, this maximum potential intensity defines the point where the input from the underlying ocean no longer exceeds the loss of that energy to friction once you have converted it over to kinetic energy. Of course, this is going to depend on the sea surface temperature, on the efficiency, and thus on the outflow temperature as well. And so I don't have specific numerical values that show up here because of that varying dependence. But no matter what those values are, there is going to be a point where these two curves cross each other and dissipation exceeds input. So how can we do this mathematically? Well, we have our expression here on the left-hand side that was just our available potential energy scaled by the efficiency. We have our expression for dissipation here on the right-hand side. We wanted to know where the two curves overlap with each other, so we can just set the two of them equal to each other. We have common factors of 10 meter wind speed on both sides, first power on the left, third power on the right. So if we solve for the second power, the 10 meter wind speed magnitude squared, we can get an expression for the maximum potential intensity. We have our efficiency multiplied by the ratio between the enthalpy and drag exchange coefficients, multiplied by this enthalpy difference between the ocean and the air that lies above. 
we typically assume that this ratio CK to CD here is equal to one, that the ability to exchange heat and moisture across the ocean matches the ability to exchange momentum due to friction across the atmosphere ocean interface. This is probably not a good approximation. It's probably a little too large when you get to higher wind speeds, but we don't have a lot of direct measurements of dissipation at high wind speeds. As you might expect, no one's really volunteering to be out on a boat in the middle of a hundred mile an hour hurricane measuring dissipation. I've heard lots of fun stories about trying to get grad students to do that, but no, we don't have a lot of those measurements. And it's tough to get those even in controlled laboratory environments as well, because you don't have the larger scape of the ocean to be able to do so within. But for now, we'll assume that this is roughly one, so that the uh, factors that control this maximum potential intensity are really the efficiency, which is governed by the sea surface temperature, and this is the surface temperature, and the outflow temperature. And then this enthalpy difference, which is governed by the sea surface temperature, the associated saturation specific humidity, and the pressure at which you are uh, found as you flow inward toward the tropical cyclone. So this is why sea surface temperature is so crucial to tropical cyclone intensification. The higher the sea surface temperature, the greater the saturation uh, specific enthalpy will be, the greater the difference this will be, and typically the greater the efficiency, the ability to actually convert that over to kinetic energy will be. So the maximum potential intensity, again, just summarizing, depends on the underlying ocean conditions through that efficiency term, epsilon, and this enthalpy disequilibrium term, that difference between the saturation specific enthalpy of the ocean and the specific enthalpy of the air that lies just above. So we can take a look at some curves to look at some of these dependencies in a little bit more of a visual format. We have the surface temperature here on the y-axis in degrees Celsius from 20 up to 32 degrees Celsius. On the x-axis, we have the outflow temperature also in degrees Celsius from zero Celsius all the way up to net or all the way down, I guess the case would be to negative 80 Celsius here. These estimates are a little bit low compared to observations, in part because of surface temperature being in the uh, denominator of the efficiency term rather than outflow temperature. When you have outflow temperature in there because of the added heat due to dissipation of turbulence along that inflow leg, these values all go up, but they take the same general shape here. And each one of these curves has a value associated with it in meters per second. So this would be 50 meters per second for this black curve that slopes from upper left to lower right. So the first thing that we notice is that all of these curves slope from upper left to lower right. So that means that any given value of the outflow temperature, if you increase your surface temperature, you go to a higher value of maximum potential intensity. From say an outflow temperature minus 20 Celsius, you go from a maximum intensity, potential intensity of 30 meters per second up to 40, 45, almost 50 meters per second as you increase your surface temperature from 20 to 32 degrees Celsius. And this is, as we might expect, higher sea surface temperature, higher surface temperature, greater energy input, and also greater efficiency at utilizing that to fuel the cyclone. We can also go the other way on the diagram here. For a given surface temperature that we see here, say 26 degrees Celsius, we start out at a maximum potential intensity of about 27, 28 Celsius. And as we go to the right, we go to higher and higher values of uh, maximum potential intensity, exceeding 60 meters per second by the time we reach an outflow temperature of about minus 80 Celsius. Now, typically, most of the tropical cyclones that we're looking at form are somewhere in the upper right quadrant of the diagram. Maximum potential intensity typically exceeds 40 meters per second for the vast majority of locations where tropical cyclones form. But of course, not every tropical cyclone reaches that intensity. That's almost 80 knots, something on the order of 90 miles per hour. So again, emphasizing that this is a maximum potential intensity. We can do this in terms of sea level pressure as well. If we make certain assumptions, uh, we can also obtain a minimum sea level pressure that corresponds to that maximum potential intensity in meters per second. So we have surface temperature again on the y-axis and outflow temperature again on the x-axis. And the curves again slope from upper left to lower right. 
So the same thing, for any given outflow temperature, say minus 40 Celsius here, as you increase the surface temperature, you have greater energy input, greater efficiency, so you have a lower uh, sea level pressure as your maximum intensity. Whereas if you take a constant surface temperature, say 26 Celsius, and decrease the outflow temperature, the minimum pressure decreases once again. We go from 1,010 millibars in the bottom left here all the way up to 850 millibars in the far upper right that we see here. So again, higher surface temperature, lower outflow temperature, greater efficiency, greater energy input, and thus a higher maximum potential intensity given by a lower minimum sea level pressure, just as we would expect from the maximum sustained uh, surface winds in our previous chart. In terms of the climatology of what this looks like, the uh, chart here is from the maximum annual value across the year. We see the color shading here is depicting the wind speed in meters per second, and it roughly follows the climatological sea surface temperature field. Highest values near to the equator, especially in the Western Pacific and Western Indian Ocean. Some exceptions here near South America where we have El Nino and typical upwelling as uh, uh, ocean currents are directed away from the coast of South America. Extending a little bit further to the north on the western end of the major ocean basins, especially in the northern hemisphere, as well as in the southern Atlantic that we see here, and not quite as far to the north on the far eastern ends of the basins here, concurrent with the ocean currents that largely follow the subtropical anticyclones. Cold currents on the east side of ocean basins, warm currents like the Gulf Stream and the Kirishio Current along the west side of the ocean basins. But over vast swaths of the major basins in which we see tropical cyclone activity, we're into the oranges and the reds, which are roughly 60 to 90 meters per second in terms of our maximum potential intensity. If we convert that over to miles per hour, we're looking at something on the order of 135 to almost 200 miles per hour for our climatological maximum potential intensity. But again, most tropical cyclones don't come anywhere close to that actual maximum potential intensity. And that's why it is a maximum potential intensity. There are charts of this. We can take real-time model data and feed this into the algorithms that we've described here with certain assumptions to be able to get a maximum potential wind speed and minimum potential sea level pressure that we have here. These charts are from mid to late April of uh, 2020, and we have the 26 and a half Celsius isotherm depicted in black lines within each of the charts. We're certainly outside of the climatological North Atlantic tropical cyclone season, but that doesn't mean that we don't have warm waters anywhere. In fact, the Caribbean Sea and south of 10 degrees north toward the equator are still very warm in terms of their ocean temperatures, sea surface temperatures. And coincidentally, we see a lot of red and uh, colder, uh, I guess colder would be right since you're getting into the purples and the blues, uh, color shadings here for minimum sea level pressure and lots of blues and purples here on the maximum sustained wind speed, which are on the order of 930 millibars and less, 97 knots and higher for minimum sea level pressure and maximum 10 meter wind speed. Again, this is no guarantee that a cyclone can form. It is a necessary condition to have sufficiently warm oceans to be able to fuel the cyclone. And if you have perfectly ideal conditions, uh, no loss of energy through ventilation, for instance, as we'll talk about in our subsequent two videos, these data represent the maximum potential intensity that you would expect the cyclone to be able to achieve. Now there are some weird intricacies that you can see here in the far North Atlantic off the coast of the Canadian Maritimes. We also see it in the maximum wind here. This is because you're in areas that you have very cold outflow temperatures associated with troughs of low pressure in the mid latitudes. This gives rise to what we know as tropical transition, which we talked about in our formation pathways lectures, 
this is obviously occurring where sea surface temperature is below that 26 and a half degrees Celsius threshold, but it highlights that so long as you can have the outflow temperature sufficiently cold, your efficiency will be relatively high, even if your energy input is not particularly high, sufficiently high enough to lead to a minimum sea level pressure or maximum 10 meter wind speed that still supports intensities on the order of strong tropical storms to lower end hurricanes, which matches up pretty well with what we saw in our climatology based off of the pathways, that most of those storms are of tropical storm to minimal hurricane intensity. The waters are typically too cold where these storms form at higher latitudes to support higher intensities, as we've now been able to document through the efficiency as well as through the amount of energy that is available to them in terms of that saturation specific enthalpy governed by the sea surface temperature. So we can ask this question, is it even possible to exceed the maximum potential intensity? It is a theoretical construct, but it's actually a really good theoretical construct, uh, very well grounded in observations. Over 99% of all observed tropical cyclone intensities are at, or more commonly, well below this theoretical maximum potential intensity. But over 99% is not 100%. There are some storms that can exceed their MPI. About 1% of cases can exceed that maximum potential intensity. So what are they? What are the characteristics of these? This almost always occurs when you have a mature tropical cyclone pass poleward, north in the northern hemisphere, south in the southern hemisphere, of a very sharp sea surface temperature gradient, like we see with the Gulf Stream in the western North Atlantic, where you go from 26, 27, 28 Celsius waters uh, to the south, very quickly to 18, 19, 20 Celsius waters to the north. It takes the cyclone some time to be able to spin down, and when it first crosses from warm to relatively cold waters, it has not yet had the time to spin down. You reach a point on the curve where dissipation exceeds the energy input and it does very rapidly spin down unless it is be able to be maintained by non-tropical forcings which often occurs at such high latitudes which is what we're talking about here with this idea of gaining energy from non-tropical sources like mid-latitude forcing so these are almost always at the end of a tropical cyclone's life cycle as they're going to higher latitudes and into colder waters, whether they're able to be sustained beyond that point by other forcings or not. There's a very, very limited number of storms that are able to do so with purely tropical forcings, and that's roughly like 10 points over a course of many, many large uh, years, and these are barely exceeding the maximum potential intensity, and there are some questions about the representativeness of those observations. So when you see a tropical cyclone achieve its maximum potential intensity, the very few percentage of cases that it has, or that actually do, it's a pretty good bet that it's in the higher latitudes, or it's a pretty good bet that it's in as favorable of an environment, moist, warm sea surface temperature, great ability to use that energy to fuel the cyclone as you're gonna be able to get. So to wrap up here, summarizing again, this efficiency represents that fraction of energy gained from the underlying ocean that actually goes into fueling the tropical cyclones winds. Not all of it is able to, only a portion of it is, and the efficiency documents what that fraction, what that percentage is. It scales with the surface and the outflow temperatures. Surface shows up in both the numerator and the denominator. Outflow shows up in the numerator there. The maximum potential intensity or MPI that we defined is where that efficiency scaled energy input, that G that we're able to gain from the underlying ocean, is overtaken by energy loss due to frictional dissipation as the ocean becomes too choppy, too turbulent, and the storm just loses energy, loses wind to that underlying ocean surface. It scales primarily with the underlying ocean conditions sea surface temperature in particular, given how that influences the efficiency as well as the enthalpy disequilibrium. Higher sea surface temperature, higher saturation specific uh, humidity, independent of whatever pressure you are looking at. 
Again, most tropical cyclones remain well below their maximum potential intensity, and only about 1% of all uh, intensity estimates approach or exceed it, and those are almost always at higher latitudes. Again, we reiterate that this is just a theoretical construct. It is not describing how cyclones intensify, even though it is very closely governed by the associated physics with that wishy process that we described in our previous video series. In our next two videos, we'll go from here to look at the primary environmental controls on tropical cyclone intensity change, vertical wind shear and environmental moisture and uh, associated impacts. We'll look at the two intertwined, looking primarily at the dynamical impacts first, and then follow that up with a discussion of the thermodynamic impacts. But until then, thanks for tuning in.